I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just going to, um, I should be at the same PowerPoint that I had last time, and we're just going to continue from there. Great. Okay. Um, so the first several cases we did like minimal change, membraneness, um, we did an IgA, thin basement membrane, diabetic nephropathy, and then Sam did a kind of challenging transplant case. Those were kind of the basic ones. Um, these are a little bit harder, um, not impossible, but like they aren't um, as easy, so don't feel bad if you're struggling through them. Um, let's have, um, Sana, do you wanna start with this one? Um, you can unmute your mic and kind of look at the one later and tell me what's on your mind after reading this information. So 37 year old Caucasian ulcerative colitis, AKI um, on mesalamine, aza and allopurinol, um, UA without protein or blood, urine protein creatinine ratio of 125, uh, several WBCs, no cast, normal ultrasound. Um, so I guess if there are a lot of WBCs, maybe interstitial nephritis. Okay. Um, especially with the mesalamine, I want to say. Um, and I guess ulcerative colitis can cause IgA, mm -hmm. I feel like. Yep. But then you yep. would expect hematuria and maybe non-nephrotic protein urea. Okay. I guess I'm thinking AIN. Okay, good. And like the um, the like you mentioned, the absence of blood on the um, sediment points in that direction. The absence of protein and the minimal proteinuria kind of push you away from a glomerular etiology, and so that would also kind of fit with AIN, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So keep that in your mind. Keep the differential of IgA. Keep the differential of AIN on your list. Then we'll look at the, the tissue. So this is low power H and E. Um, I guess the tubules look fairly apart, so there does seem to be hypocellularity in the interstitium. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where the glomeruli are. There's only one here. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, there's something here. Know. We'll we'll show you a higher picture of this. This could be kind of mistaken for glomerulus. It's actually not, but there's okay. one here. Um, okay. And you mentioned the uh, cells within the interstitium, right? Even at this power, you can see all it's of it. expanded. This. Yeah. Yeah, so that's not normal. Um, okay, so I'll give you some higher power. So here's uh, one of the glomeruli. Uh, what stain? This is high power PAS stain. Excellent. Um, so I guess looking at the glomeruli, um, the basement membrane looks okay. The mesangium looks okay. The capillary loops look open. Um, but then going towards the interstitium, there are a bunch of cells in there and all the tubules, like we saw in low power, they're kind of apart. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the tubular lumens look like closed also. Yeah, they're filled with stuff. It's, they're, they're hard to really see. There's, uh, uh, I think that you'll get a better image of it later on. But yeah, you mentioned... They're not close to each other. There's space yeah. within the interstitium, and there's a cellular infiltrate within that yeah. interstitium. Okay, and this glomerulus, like you mentioned, looks pretty good. Um, there were 23 total glomeruli in the sample. All of them looked like this, this except for five, which were globally sclerosed. Okay. All right. I guess this is also BAS. Um, there are some like that tubule maybe towards three o'clock seems like it has the cast in it. This one? Uh, I guess that too, but oh, that seems to be like, maybe that's the white cell cast, but I was actually looking at the tubule beside to beside that. This one here? The one here? to the right of that. Oh, here. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that might be just hyaline. I mean, there's no cellular yeah. material there. Um, okay. This that one looks can... cellular. Yeah, this is cellular, so it and there's nuclei, so that makes it a white cell cast, like you mentioned. Right. Great. Okay. So now, um, how does your differential feel? You feel pretty good about AIN now. You feel like this could be IgA. Yeah, I'm seeing AIN. AIN, right? It's pretty classic, right? You have um, you have a white cell cast here. Mm -hmm. You got the cellular infiltrate here, um, which are mostly lymphocytes actually. 
Uh, I'm going to okay. show you a weird finding here. So this is kind of like a closer up um, of that weird thing that we saw on higher power or on lower power. This is a higher power view of that H and E. Is that a granuloma? Yeah, excellent. So this is a granuloma. So you have giant cells, like these nuclei are bigger than these lymphocytes. So these are giant cells. And this is a granuloma mm -hmm. that is uh, forming within the interstitium. And this is nice. You can really see the H and E, how cool it is. You have some eosinophils here. You got some neutrophils here. You got mm -hmm. a lot of lymphocytes. So you can actually see the different types of cells with H and E. But this is a granuloma. Um, okay, so what would this diagnosis be? It seems like acute interstitial nephritis. Okay, great. And can you get granulomas in interstitial nephritis? I think so. Yes, you can. So this is actually a subset of interstitial nephritis that we would call granulomatous interstitial nephritis. Okay. And you were absolutely right in the very beginning, um, implicating the mesalamine. Um, that was what was thought to be the culprit here. So we stopped the mesalamine. We gave mm -hmm. him some steroids and his creatinine. Didn't come all the way back down to normal, but came down to about 1.8, which is a lot better than the mid fours that he was hanging out at. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right, uh, maybe Andy, let's have you do this one. I don't think you got a chance last time. Yeah, so let's see, a 32-year-old male history, not really much of a past medical history, it looks like, mm -hmm. uh, presenting with T-colored urine, edema, and hypertension. So definitely just off of that, sounding more like a nephritic type of picture, uh, especially with the hypertension and T-colored urine, which I presume is going to be hematuria, uh, which we see that confirmed on the urinalysis as well with 3-plus blood and 3-plus protein and evidence of RBC cas. Uh, urine protein creatinine ratio kind of in the nephrotic range, 3.5 grams per gram. I presume he was non-oliguric or was he? Uh, Non-oliguric here, yep. Okay. Um, his C3 was low, C4 looks like it's that's pretty low to you. Um, ANA, DSDNA, HIV, hepatitis, all negative and serology is otherwise still pending. Um, so top differentials at this point, given this uh, information? Uh, I mean, definitely IgA could potentially present like this. Um, if he had an infection recently, I think that would make me potentially suspicious for like a post-infectious GN, um, especially with the low complement factors here. Um, I think lupus would be much less likely, especially given the negative ANA and double-stranded DNA as well. Um, vasculitis, maybe, um, although I'll, I think that's a little bit lower on the differential too. Okay, all right, that's a good differential. Let's keep that in mind as we look at the images here. Okay, um, so this is a H and E. Um, looks like there's a fair amount of glomeruli, at least C3. Uh, the interstitium looks like there's a lot of cells there. Um, tubules don't really look back to back in this section. In addition, the tubules also look pretty dilated as well, um, which may suggest some degree of injury. Yeah, these definitely look like injured tubules. Um, it, it, it shows up nicer on a PAS when you can actually see the brush border, um, but the brush border in tubular injury, they actually slough off, but this dilated tubule is a sign of tubular injury. Um, all right, we'll give you a higher power view of glomeruli so you can kind of see what's going on there. So H&E again. Um, definitely hypercellular in the glomeruli. Can't really tell if the capillary loops are open. Um, it almost looks like there's PMNs that are within the capillaries itself? Yes, there are. Okay, um, so let's try to point them out. You can see here, right, these three nuclei here, here. So these are um, PMNs or neutrophils. Okay, and those are never normal in the glomeruli. Um, you mentioned the capillary loops don't appear open. So uh, remind us all again, what is that term called when you don't have loops open and you have cells within them? 
uh, is it endocapillary pro proliferation? Excellent. So you have endocapillary proliferation and hypercellularity that looks predominantly like neutrophils. Uh, great. I'll give you another image. Uh, also H&E once again. Um, kind of similar to last time. Um, you can definitely still see the presence of the PMNs. Um, you can kind of see the capillary loops in some areas open, but predominantly it looks like there's this infiltrate. Okay. Um, is that a partial crescent even? Hard to say. It looks like there's something kind of going on in Bowman space over here. It's yeah. hard to tell. Uh, to technically, to be a crescent, you have to have at least two cell layers of proliferation. Right. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell. I think if, if I just saw this image, I would have to ask Joe, like, what did the next next uh, slice down look like? And you can either see if that's artifact, if they cut it weird, if it was a crescent, or maybe it was a, a, a scar. But yeah, it does look suspicious like something could be going on here. Um, so back to your differential. Um, IgA and infection or post-infectious kind of were the highest up with vasculitis being the third. Um, what are you thinking now with what you're, with these two images that you saw so far of pulmonary life? I think with the presence of the neutrophils, it makes me more suspicious for an infection-related GN potentially. Great. Yeah, remember, kids, you can have hypercellularity, you, mesangial hypercellularity, you can have endocapillary proliferation in IgA too. Those are actually hallmarks of the disease. But usually, I shouldn't say usually, I don't think it's ever neutrophils that are causing that cellularity. So the neutrophils in the glomeruli here are definitely screaming out that this is kind of an infection or post-infectious. Okay. Um, also a H and E once again. Um, so this definitely looks like there's a crescent <laughs> yeah. uh, in this one. Yeah. So here's the normal glomerulus. And even that doesn't look normal. There's a lot of junk in there. There's a lot of cells. It's harder at this kind of mid power, but there's still some polys in there. And then now here we see this crescent in Bowman space that is definitely several cell layers thick. Um, and does it look, uh, so when you look at crescents, we usually kind of classify them it, it, acute or chronic. And we usually use the words cellular or fibrous or if they're in kind of in the middle, fibrocellular, what would you call this crescent? I think cellular. Yeah. Predominantly cells. Yeah. So you can see there's a lot of cells going on here. So this is a cellular crescent, which usually implies that this is active, that this has happened relatively recent. And if you didn't catch this early and you biopsy this patient maybe weeks later, those cells would disappear and this would just become fibrous. Um, it would still kind of look like a crescent or maybe this whole glomeruli would be dead. Um, but this is definitely a cellular crescent. Great, okay. <clears throat> so this is a silver stain. Um, So I mean, is, is yeah. there anything um, that you expect to see in, in an infection associated GN on silver? Um, I mean, in some areas, it almost looks like maybe there's some double contours, but. Yeah, so there's no classic finding. Um, and I can't remember exactly why I'm showing this image, but actually now that I look at it, so I wanna go back actually to this image. So when you have a crescent form, the reason a crescent forms is because part of the basement membrane in the capillary loop ruptures mm -hmm. and you spill out those contents into Bowman space and then you get proliferation. So actually now that I look at this, um, it almost does look like here, here for example is a capillary loop and maybe this area ruptured here because you don't see it kind of staining. Um, you can almost see like other capillary loops like there's there's a break here. This normally would be nice and closed, but there's actually okay. a space in between there. So I'm kind of stretching. There's no classic finding for infection associated GN, but I think I was putting the silver out to see if maybe there were any obvious breaks in the basement membrane. Um, all right, so now we're gonna go to IF. Uh, we're thinking infection. We're less thinking IgA. 
Although, don't forget, you can have uh, infectious, infection-associated IgA2, which would be one of those weird things. So in classic post-infectious, what do you expect to see on immunofluorescence? Uh, so you would see IgG, um, IgM, and probably C3 as well. Great. Okay, so here's your C3. <clears throat> Pretty granular staining. It almost looks like it's, I don't know, hard to say if it's mesangial predominant or if it's glimmer or within the loops. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, like there's a lot of stuff here. This, I, I think it's certainly within the loops, at least portions of it, because this is out in the periphery and here's capillary loops for sure out in the edge. But there could be some stuff going on here. Um, so this was positive for, like you said, C3 IgG. I can't remember if IgM was as well but um, this is the only IF image I'm gonna show you. IgA was negative. So as we move to um, EM, we're gonna be looking for deposits, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, so the first thing you wanna do is kind of orient yourself, uh, which is the urinary space and which side is the blood space. Um, so looking at kind of the far left, that looks like around nine o'clock or okay. so. Okay. That's, that's the urinary space there. Um, you can see the podocytes and epithelial foot processes kind of adjacent to that, which means that the other spaces would be the blood side. Um, you definitely do see pretty large electron dense deposits there. Mm -hmm. um, Looks like there's some in the mesangium and then also some in the subendothelial space as well. Yeah, it's kind of a weird location. So this is a, this is a weird biopsy because where's the classic location of post-infectious GN? You'd usually see it subepithelial. Right. So classically, you see subepithelial humps, like big dome-like deposits kind of out here, which we don't see. These actually I would classify as... Intramembranous. intramembranous so they're not truly subendothelial they're not like kind of here within the capillary loop they're certainly not sub epithelial either like you would see here but they're kind of like these intramembranous deposits which is a little unusual for your classic post-infectious gn but i think that's kind of what we're seeing here is intramembranous deposits okay okay um, and so that was a good differential, a good read of the biopsy. And I thought, so even though it doesn't fit the textbook perfectly, um, I think we're stuck calling this kind of post-infectious glomerulonephritis. And if I recall, this is a patient I saw in consults like a couple of years ago. Um, and he didn't have a preceding um, viral infection per se, but we did like anti streptolysino antibodies and all those things on him. And after the after the biopsy and those ended up coming back positive so we felt like it was consistent with infection even though he didn't have the infection clinically okay okay great um we got another one let's see mother uh sana is intramembranous the same as miss angel no um so Ms., um so here, here here's not you don't have a great image of the mesangium here intramembranous means you're within the basement membrane. So this is a capillary loop, right? And so this is subendothelial. This would be subepithelial. And if they're within the basement membrane, like these, like you can see here's basement membrane kind of completely surrounding these. That's why I'm calling these intramembranous deposits. So mesangial deposits would be kind of in here. I don't know. I mean, I can zoom back and really find a picture from his angel deposit, I think. Um, so these are his angel deposits. This was an IgA case. So you can see here, this is in the mesangial area. Um, and then here is the capillary loop. So if you had deposits like this, here and they were completely surrounded by the basement membrane those would be intramembranous but because these are within the mesangium we call these mesangials does that make sense sana okay great um and madhuri says i don't have audio but i can type out what she reads okay let's do that let's see how it works out
Okay. Is that right? Yeah, here we are. Okay. Um, let's go ahead. So uh, reading this one, I'll read it out for you since you don't have audio. 71-year-old female worsening edema and her outpatient workup had IgG lambda monoclonal protein with ele elevated lambda free light chain. So she was admitted for bone marrow biopsy, which showed an MGUS. Her creatinine is normal at one. Albumin is low at 1.8. Urine protein to creatinine ratio is 5.8 grams per gram, nephrotic range, and her kidneys are big. So that's your one-liner. Based on that, um, tell us what stands out and what's like maybe your top couple differentials as we go to the tissue. Uh, differential amyloid, monoclonal deposition disease versus less likely cast nephropathy. Okay, that, that's great. That's exactly what I would be thinking of too. So a couple things as we kind of um, move to the images. Amyloid is high in this differential because this is more of a nephrotic syndrome. Um, and that's classically how amyloid will present. Cast nephropathy um, more likely shows a acute rise in kidney function. So the creatinine is almost never normal in cast nephropathy. You can have proteinuria, but it um, usually doesn't present with nephrotic syndrome. Um, and the low albumin, like she says, it makes her think that either amyloid or monoclonal deposition disease will be more likely comparatively. All right, that's good. All right, so let me go to image. Try Chrome, excellent. And if nothing jumps out at you, that's fine too. A lot of blue, normal creatinine. Yeah, so there's blue for sure, um, but it's not, so there, it's kind of patchy. Like this area doesn't look as good as this area. Like this area actually looks pretty good, even though it's blue. You can see the tubules are nice and tightly packed. Um, we have glomeruli here. We'll look at them higher power later on. But yeah, there's there's some blue going on over here. All right. So this is glomerulus. Switch stain first of all. H and E, excellent. Okay. Normal or abnormal? This is a tough one, so. Okay, so it's abnormal. And I'll just point out the area that is abnormal so that everyone can see it. So here we have stuff, whatever it may be. Okay, so this is abnormal. Shouldn't have all of this, right? This doesn't even look like kidney. Like this looks like a capillary loop, capillary loop, but there's some stuff going on here. So uh, mesangial nodularity is the word that Madhuri is using, and that's a great one. I'm going to show you another image, but yeah, this definitely looks kind of nodular. So maybe for others, when you have a, a, a biopsy like this that has nodules in it, what's your biggest differential? Like, what are things that you think about when you have nodules in the glomeruli? Diabetes, amyloid, great, okay. Um, you could still, this could still be um, light chain deposition, right? Um, there is an idiopathic nodular glomerulosclerosis, which is kind of classically seen in old white men who smoke. But that's pretty, yeah, when you see this, like you should definitely be thinking about diabetes and amyloid. And so we're, the, the, the challenge here will be trying to differentiate is this diabetes or amyloid. And there are some stains that we're going to use. Okay, so here, again, you see the nodule. Okay, so Madhuri is saying, can I have a PAS? I will give you a PAS. Okay, how does a PAS help you? If poorly staining the amyloid. Yeah, so actually it's a little tricky because amyloid has kind of weak 
staining for uh, P on PAS, um, whereas diabetes, which is more related to collagen, will be stronger. Is there another stain that could be used, better used to differentiate um, collagen versus amyloid? Silver, great, I'll give you silver later on. All right, not yet there. First, we have another unusual finding here. Hypercellular endocapillary. So yeah, there's definitely um, some capillary loops that are not open. There's some stuff in them, but it doesn't look like cells, right? This doesn't look like uh, endocapillary proliferation per se, because what is proliferation usually means cells. Capillary loops are closed, but there's stuff in there. It's kind of like a pink material, but it's not cellular. Um, there is a finding here, which is a crescent again. Okay, remember crescents are not specific for a disease. You can see crescents in just about anything. I even saw a patient with diabetic nephropathy once that had crescents. Um, all it means is a basement membrane's ruptured and you have proliferation in Bowman space. So in this case, with our differential amyloid uh, light chain deposition, could it be that those deposits, whatever this stuff is within the um, capillary loop has broken open the capillary loop and led to a crescent. That's kind of what I'm thinking. All right, so you wanted a silver. So here's your silver. Um, is light chain deposition more likely due to the crescent? Not that I'm aware of. I'd have to look to see if it is more um, associated, but to my knowledge, um, light chain deposition versus amyloid, both could lead to crescents. I don't think crescents are um, normal findings in either of those diseases, but I don't think they're particularly unique to either one either that I'm aware of, but I'd have to look. All right, so here's your silver. So remember what the silver stains for, which is the collagen in the basement membrane. So if you had diabetic nephropathy, the silver, those nodules on silver would be really dark. And here, as Madhuri says, you have silver negative nodules. So like here, for example, would have been a nodule, right? But it's not staining at all. Okay, so this is very different than diabetes. Actually, if I can, I'm gonna go back real quick. I wanna go back to the, I had a diabetic case here. So you can see what the silver looks like on diabetes, on, in diabetic, right? So this was, this is a diabetic um, patient on silver. So this is a nodule as well, but you can see how strongly positive this one is um, compared to this other one, which is silver negative as Mothery mentioned. Okay, so we have a silver negative nodule. We have nodular glomerulosclerosis. We have some pink stuff within the capillary loops. We already thought amyloid was possible, so now you're gonna want the Congo red. So here's the Congo red. And so you see stuff here, okay? And to really know if it's amyloid, it has to turn green when you uh, put it under polarized light. So here's what that looks like. All right, so this is pretty classic for amyloid, right? Definitely positive, yeah. And what's really cool is it's not just in the glomeruli. You have it all, this is a tubular basement membrane. You have this Congo red positive stuff everywhere. So it's, even though it's not, um, it's always thought of as causing nephrotic syndrome, amyloid can be anywhere, right? All it means is that these, these lambda light chains have folded into a beta pleated sheet and led to this particular substructure. Okay, and then it should restrict. Um, is there a vessel in the image? No, let's see here. So this looks like a vessel. Um, this definitely looks like a vessel. I would imagine that this would be Congo red too. Um, it's hard to tell if this is a vessel or a tubule, but I actually think this might be a vessel too. It's, it's hard because we're so kind of close up. But my guess is that this would definitely have been Congo red as well. You can already see how it kind of lights up so much more. Okay. Um, and then on immunofluorescence, you have, oops, 
I don't know why that image keeps disappearing. But you have restriction of the um, light chain. So in this case, it would be lambda. OK, great. All right, so now we're going to move to EM. This EM is challenging. There's a lot going on here. All right, hard to even orient yourself, really. Yeah, Madhuri, restriction was all in caps, so she is shouting at her computer right now. OK, um, so let's point out what we do know, which is that this is a capillary loop, right? And Madhuri says it's been measured out, so there's thickness here. So that's pr a pretty normal thickness, actually. So here's a capillary loop. This is um, urine space podocytes. This is um, subendothelial or blood space. And this is mesangium. And there's stuff in the mesangium, right? Like this is not normal just to see all of this um, unusual stuff. So this is kind of what was causing those nodules, right? All of this um, material that was in, um, that we were seeing on those uh, H&E stains that were causing those nodules is seen here in the EM here. All right, so now we're gonna get a little closer. Again, capillary loop, blood space, urine space, mesangium. And again, stuff, it's like a, a wheat field of randomness, okay? So, and you can look closely and you can actually see that there's uh, some organization, right? Ir uh, Madhuri states, irregularly arranged fibrils. Yeah, I'll give you a higher power view. So now we're going to take um, like this area, and we're going to zoom in five to ten times. Okay. So definitely um, organized substructure, definitely irregular, um, and definitely fibrils. So I'm gonna zoom in again, same field, I'm just gonna go even closer. Okay, so we, already, we had amyloid on our list, it's Congo red positive, we're definitely thinking of amyloid. So what's the um, uh, diameter of, the, of classic amyloid fibrils? Yeah, nine to 12, so in that range, which is small nanometers, so we asked, the pathologist to actually measure measure them, which they can do. And so these are in that range. So these are small nine to 12 nanometer randomly arranged fibrils causing nodular glomerulosclerosis, conga red positive, right? So this is amyloid. And uh, Madhuri says amyloid is smaller than fibrillar, which is smaller than immunotactoid, which is correct. I actually think I have an image here that shows that, yeah. Great, okay, so this was from um, an image from Nefsim. So you have amyloid fibrils. This is the classic size. They're Congo red positive, randomly arranged. Fibrillary GN, little bigger. They're usually closer to 20. Congo red negative, randomly arranged. And then immunotactoid are the big fibrils that are more than 30 nanometers. And they are seen in parallel bundles rather than random. Um, this is a very, rare, honestly, all of these are quite rare. Collagen fibrotic GN also have even bigger um, sized fibrils. So the, the weird thing about it is actually you can have Congo red positive fibrillary GN. So it's not always Congo red negative. And then it also then begs the question like, is this amyloid, is this fibrillary? It's the size of fibrillary, but it's Congo red positive. I don't have the right answer to that. And you could actually, potentially have both diseases coexisting. But this is how you should remember. And I think the easiest way personally to remember this, my mnemonic, is the smaller the word, amyloid, fibrillary, immunotactoid, collagenofibrotic, the smaller the fibrils. As the words themselves get longer, bigger, the fibrils themselves get bigger. Okay, here's a, a picture of what immunotactoid looks like, okay? Um, you can see these are not randomly arranged. It's almost like we took um, spaghetti and like have a bundle of it in our hand and we're looking at it like kind of down its line. So these are in parallel or in bundle. And if you were to zoom out on an immunotactoid patient, 
this is what you'd see. It looks kind of, it looks totally freaky, I think. But these are the fibrils of immunotactoid, which again, very different in appearance than amyloid, which is just kind of like you just threw all of those fibrils to the ground and they just fell wherever they were. Does that make sense? These are pretty rare diseases, but they're pretty cool uh, to look at. Okay, excellent job, Madhuri. Very nicely done. Okay, I think I only have one more. It's a hard one, though. Um, let's have maybe two of you kind of tag team it. Maybe Gonzalo, if you have a mic, and Maggie, if you want to kind of look at this one together. It's a lupus one, and so you're going to have to try to figure out what we're dealing with. Okay. So 21 year old African American female, one, one year history of lupus with joint skin, metallurgic manifestations, plaque window only, prednisone for arthritis. She's got some subnephrotic proteinuria. Creatinine is almost normal. Low C3, low C4, very high double stranded DNA. So we have classic lupus and kind of a classic patient and they're referred to us for proteinuria and we're doing the biopsy because um, we have to figure out what further treatment she needs. Okay, Maggie's gonna, doesn't have a mic, but she's gonna type in some suggestions too. All right, um, all right, so uh, at, it's not a question of what this patient has. We know they're gonna have lupus nephritis, but it's gonna be a question of what findings of lupus nephritis do they have and what classification does she have? Because that's going to guide what kind of treatment we're going to have to give her. So it looks like H&E. Oh, yeah. Yep. From I, here. Type as much as you want, Maggie. I'm going to watch you too. Go ahead. Go ahead, Gonzalo. Uh, so a couple glomerulus there. It's like there's a fair amount of like infiltrates around the some of the tubules yeah, on tubules. the right side. Yeah. Tubules here look pretty good. Um, there is some, you know, when you're right around the glomerulus, the tubules there sometimes can have cells or the, the, the interstitium there can have cells. That's not specific for like AIN or anything. Um, even at this power, do the glomeruli look normal? Can you see something about them that kind of strikes you? There are cells inside the glomerulus, more than what we've used right now. Okay, great. So you're, we're already thinking there's some cellularity uh, within the glomeruli. And um, when we talk about lupus nephritis, the difference between class three and class four, what, what's the difference between class three and class four? Um, I guess the degree of proliferation, like if it's global or segmental. So it's not the difference in global or six metal, it's how many glomeruli are involved in the entire sample, right? So if you have a class three, it is a focal process, which means that some glomeruli, but not all are involved. So it's, typically it's less than 50%. And if you have a diffuse process, that is class four, which means that all glomeruli are involved or according to the classification, greater than 50% are involved. So if you just look at these five, maybe even six glomeruli, if you want to count this one on the edge, one, two, three, four, five, six. Do you think we're dealing with a focal process wherein only some of the glomeruli are involved or a diffuse process where all of them are involved? Maggie thinks it's diffuse. Christina does too. Okay, yes, I would agree, diffuse. So. There appear to be too many cells in all of these glomeruli. We'll, we'll, get, we'll give you higher powers of, of some of them so you get an idea of what we're dealing with. There's definitely a mesangial expansion, more cellularity in the mesangium. Um, some endocapillary proliferation, I think, too, because some. Yeah. Um, right, so we have endocapillary proliferation here. Nice one, Christina. Christina caught it too. So we definitely have endocapillary proliferation here, here, here. Some of the loops look fine, right? Like this area looks okay. This area looks closed. 
Um, and I mean, this is no doubt mesangial hypercellularity, right? I mean, you have like 10 cells in the space. I mean, this looks like 15 cells in the space. So there's hypercellularity within the mesangium, endocapillary proliferation, great. Any um, crescents, anything else that you see here? Any areas of active necrosis? Okay, I don't see any other. Um, Madhuri's asking, do some of the outer loops look thickened? Yeah, they do, and I'm gonna show you why later on. So some of these areas do look a little thickened. Hard to tell on an H&E, but I will show you why they look thickened later. I think there are some nodules here, I think, or at least some fibrin, or like fibrinous material, I guess. Yeah, so in this area here? Yep. Yeah, it, looks, it definitely looks redder, right? So um, it's hard to call this a nodule. Usually a nodule pushes the cells out to the periphery, okay? So when you have cells within that area, you usually don't call it a nodule. So this wouldn't be a nodule per se because it's just filled with cells. Christina is correct here, fibrinoid necrosis. So the fact that this area looks so much pinker and more red than this area, and if you actually look within, um, air, I mean, it's hard, but you can almost see like cellular debris, like there's like cellular debris here, which we call karyorexis, where the cells themselves are dying and undergoing apoptosis as a result of the necrosis. So this is an area of fibrinoid necrosis. So this is a weird one, right? Because this part of the glomerulus, other than the hypercellularity, looks okay. There's mesangial hypercellularity, but here we're looking pretty good. And here we have this area of fibrinoid necrosis. So this would be what we call a segmental, segmental meaning a portion of the glomerulus, a segmental necrotizing lesion. Okay. Okay, so that's a PAS chain. Um... The loops are open on one side, but then I guess there's also similar to the other one, fibrinoid necrosis on like the right side. Yeah, this area doesn't look good. Um, there's a lot of cells here. Hard to know um, on a PAS. So PAS, remember, stains for the basement membrane better. I, I honestly don't even remember how fibrinoid necrosis stains on PAS. My guess is it would be bright pink as well. Um, all right, I'm gonna give you one more. Excellent job, Maggie. Um, okay. Silver. Silver. Um, and I'll tell you first, there is there are abnormal findings here. Let's let's, <laughs> let's figure out what the abnormal finding is. Hmm. Well, I think as Valerie said, some of those like loops have a like a thicker basement membrane than what we're used to. Right? And I guess there's some maybe some spikes on, on Yeah. That. There are definitely spikes. Like, look out here. Oh, this yeah. I was looking at the other side. Big spikes on this side. So the basement membrane, hard, hard to say. It looks, looks thick in some areas. Um, looks ragged in other areas. We can definitely see raggedness here. Here are some good spikes, right? Here are some big spikes. Um, so we're definitely dealing with some spikes. And again, lupus can be a lot of things. We saw a lot of stuff already. Madhuri's question, is the best stain for fibrinoid necrosis trichome? Um, you know, that's a question for Joe. Uh, you can definitely see pink on the trichrome that is um, fibrinoid necrosis. Usually, I, I think it's pretty obvious in the H&E too because the fibrin looks so red compared to the regular um, H&E. Um, and then you can also see the cells really well in the h &E. And so usually the, you can see the cells um, decaying and you can see like the nuclei, the nuclei from the cells turning into karyorexis. So I'm not sure what's the quote unquote best. Certainly on the, on the trichrome, you can have a pretty obvious um, fibrinoid necrosis because it will look bright pink. Okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on to IF. And so we're dealing with um, a process that appears to be involving all of the glomeruli. We didn't see a single normal one. 
So, um, so here, let me ask you a question. Is this just, could you just call this class two, Lucas? Is this just Ms. Angel? And what, what makes the difference between a Ms. Angel lupus and a class four lupus? And maybe I'll, I'll put that, that's a really high level question. I'll put that question out to everyone. So Madhuri says endocapillary involvement. Okay, so that's one of those active lesions that can make something class four and not just Ms. Angel. This is another one of them, right? This segmental necrotizing lesion, the fibrinoid necrosis, crescents, exactly. So if you didn't see any of that and you just saw stuff in the mesangium, you would probably be calling it class two. But the fact that you see all these other active lesions makes you have to say that there are active lesions that are involving more than half of the glomeruli and therefore it's a class four. The fact that we're seeing spikes here makes you think that maybe we're dealing with membranous too, so it might be a mixed four or five. Um, so how does a lupus stain on um, immunofluorescence? Full house. Full house, so everything, everything and everywhere, right? So here's IgG, okay, and it's definitely capillary loops, mesangial too, but it's definitely in the capillary loops really strong staining, okay? And like you said, full house, so you have, okay, so we're, let's, let's, we're zooming in, really high power. We don't always do this um, here uh, in our biopsy conferences, but we used to do this um, in my fellowship. We would zoom in super high power to the immunofluorescence, and we would try to guess where would the electron dense deposits be on EM. So here, you have a capillary loop, right? And do you think it's brightest in the subendothelial or the subepithelial space? Subepithelial. Yeah, I agree. Because it seems to be on the outside where you're seeing most of it, not on the inside, right? So you have, you have positivity in the mesangium here, but I would agree, these are really strongly staying all along the basement membrane on, on the outside as well. Okay. So we had positivity for IgA, IgM, C3, C4, classic full house lupus. So it's not a question of what we're dealing with. Now let's look for the deposits. Yep. So it looks like the deposits are actually, yeah, on the sub epithelial side. Okay. Yeah. Um, so remember, like, let's just go back up here. Remember, like, when you're doing EM, you're zooming in really close to one portion. So, for example, if you zoomed in here, this area looks pretty normal, right? It doesn't look too bad. Uh, whereas if you zoomed in here, it would look really bad. Um, so you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at EM, like you can, you can be patchy. So we definitely see deposits. So you mentioned subepithelial. This is the one deposit that I'm seeing in the capillary loop. How would you classify this one? This, this kind of goes back to Sana's question. So we have three options. Is this, actually we have four options. Is this subendothelial, subepithelial, intramembranous, or mesangial? Intramembranous. Yes. Right, so you can clearly see that the basement membrane completely surrounds this deposit. So this actually would be an intramembranous deposit. Right, if, if it was poking out to this area, it would be subepithelial. If it was into this area, it'd be subendothelial. So this is actually an intramembranous deposit. Um, where else do you see deposits? So out, the capillary loop itself looks okay. Mesangium. Mesangium, yes. Good, good job, Maggie. So here are all of your mesangial deposits right, all over here. Lots of stuff with the mesangium. Okay. Um, here's another one. I think those are sub epithelial. Yeah, so we see a combination of different things, but definitely some sub epithelial. Uh, this one's really great because, again, this highlights the spike. Remember the spikes in the silver stain for the basement membrane? 
So it would be staining this, and then down here, and then this, and this. So this is why you see those spikes. So that's, this, is, this correlates with those spikes that we saw in the silver. So we're, here we have subepithelial deposits. Here, intermembranous. This was kind of borderline subepithelial, subepithelial, more stuff in the mesangium. Here's another one. Those are the same subepithelial Yeah, more of the same, right? So you can see here that these are kind of in various stages of being subepithelial or intramembranous. So like this image, for example, correlates super well with this, right? Because here we're seeing the capillary loop and here is all that highlighted IgG, IgM, IgA, C3, C4. And when we actually look for it, this is what we're seeing. Okay. okay. Um, and when you actually zoom in on um, lupus deposits, um, you can actually see some substructure to them, not, un not unlike um, amyloid, um, but that's not, um, that's not always the case and it's not um, distinctive in any way. But if you zoom in really close on lupus deposits, Sometimes they can look like fibrils and have organization as well. Hey, Madhuri's question. Is it surprising that there are no subendothelial deposits with endocapillary proliferation? Yeah, so I believe that's probably a sampling issue, right? Remember, because we're just catching, when they do EM on someone, they're not doing all the glomeruli. And as you can see, like from the biopsy, like maybe they caught a biopsy that didn't have endocapillary proliferation. Um, or a portion of the biopsy. So had they sampled here, you probably would have seen subendothelial. Um, so the fact that you only saw intramembranous and subepithelial deposits doesn't mean that they didn't have subendothelial deposits somewhere else. I can almost guarantee you that if you had looked hard enough and done more EM on more glomeruli, you would have seen them. But it's just hard. You have to imagine, like, when we do EM, we're literally looking at this area and so you'd have to like look at a lot uh, to sample all of the glomerulus or all of the glomeruli and lupus manifests in so many different ways okay so now uh we have um that so how would you uh classify this um lupus um how would you stage it for um for any of you, I guess. One, two, three, four, five, six, or a mix of the two? Four, five, maybe. Four, five. So definitely five, because we got membranous. Uh, and it's four if all, if you have all, if you have a diffuse process. So yeah, so this would be a four, five lupus. Um, so really quick, I think, I mean, that's the last true biopsy, but I wanted to talk a little bit about like at the end about lupus so that you guys are, are, are clear. There's some um, classified. So this kind of goes back to, um, um, I'm trying to think, who was it? Madhuri's question? Someone asked about these uh, thick outer loops. Oh yeah, yeah. Some of the outer loops look thick. All right, so this is a classic lesion in lupus. This might, might have been similar to what we were seeing. So let's say you had a lupus patient and you had these lesions, and you zoomed up real close, this is what it looked like. So do you, anyone know what you would call these? Yes, Christina, wire loops. So these are wire loop lesions, okay? So these are basically massive subendothelial deposits that make the basement membrane look thick, not because the basement membrane itself is thick, but because there's so much immune complex material there that it causes the loop to look like a wire. So they, they call these wire loop lesions. So this would be an active lesion again in lupus. If you saw this, you couldn't just call it a class two. This would be an active lesion. If you did an EM on a wire loop, this is what it would look like. Okay, this is not from our patient. This is, I think, from a textbook of some sort. But here's your capillary loop. And you can see, this is a massive subendothelial deposit. 
And when you look at an, on H and E, you're seeing that wire loop, okay? So this is pretty impressive. How about this? What would this lesion be called in this? Kind of a weird image. I don't, the, the staining is different than our normal biopsy. So this is um, a capillary loop and something within the capillary loop. So um, close, it's, it's hard. It's not, uh, so fibronoid necrosis usually um, ruptures the capillary loop, but this is um, actually a thrombus within the capillary loop that is composed of antigen antibody complexes. So they actually call this um, a hyaline thrombus. Also would be considered an active lesion in lupus. All right, so let's say you did a kidney biopsy in lupus and everything looked pretty normal, but then you got to EM and you didn't see a bunch of deposits, but you had foot process effacement like this. Excellent, Madhuri. So this is lupus podocytopathy, and it's not a class of lupus. You can't say class one, two, three, four, five, whatever. You would just call it lupus podocytopathy, and it's almost like minimal change in lupus. Um, so that's, that's excellent. So that can be seen. Um, this is unusual, but kind of, kind of going along with um, the, when I zoomed in on those uh, electron dense deposits, it almost looked like they had a, a, a substructure. So when you zoom in on lupus deposits, sometimes they can have a substructure like this. Here's another image of it. They, they call it thumb printing. It literally looks like a fingerprint, right? It's so unusual. And it can lead to a, a, a fibril as well, not unlike amyloid. So that's just something to keep in mind. This is again, seen in lupus, it's also seen in things like cryoglobulinemia, um, and then obviously in amyloid, fibrillary, ITG, all those things too. Um, okay, and then so just uh, to really quickly go over this. So this is the old WHO, one, two, three, four, five, six. The new, as of 2003, is not that new anymore. Kind of is the same thing, so if you just had, um, minimal mesangial proliferation and IF that stained, you could be a class one or a class two. If you have focal lesions, which means less than 50% of glomeruli involved, then you are class three. If you have diffuse lesions, I typically think of that as all glomeruli involved, but you know, greater than 50%, then you have class four. And then they would further subclassify them as diffuse segmental or diffuse global. This is really complicated. Involving only part of the glomeruli or involving all of the glomeruli. And they would also classify this as for active, like active lesions or C, chronic lesions or mixed. So you can see how like the classification of lupus actually becomes like a major headache. When we talk about active lesions, we already talked about some of them. So cellular proliferation, if you rupture the capillary wall, which leads to crescent, karyorectic debris, wire loops, hyaline thrombi, fibrin thrombi, segmental necrosis. So in our patient that we saw, there was cellular proliferation, but there was also um, some wire loops. There were also some segmental fibrinoid necrosis. There was also endocapillary proliferation. Okay, so that would all kind of put this as more than just mesangial. And when they talk about chronic lesions, there's glomerulosclerosis, fibrous crescents in IFTA, which we normally think about. So classifying lupus is really complicated, um, but it's fun to read these biopsies. These are probably the most challenging ones for us to read. Um, they're challenging even for like people like Joe to classify because there's so much going on. And I think that is it. Uh, any questions from anyone right now? That's about an hour, perfect. You're welcome, Maggie. Okay, great. I will um, 